Let's derive Black-Scholes equation. We've paid the, the price by doing the technical lemmas, now let's get the payoff. All right, what's the situation? So we have S of t is our asset price, and let's say that V of S and t is our option price. And we're gonna say it's one call option. So how do we get started? How do we find a formula for V? Let's make an assumption. So assume that S is log normal. So we saw that before. What does that mean? That means that ds is the drift plus the volatility. All right, so here is the drift is proportional to the size of the, the asset, and then the volatility is also proportional to the, to the size. And this gives the log normal random walk. Now the fundamental idea of the Black-Scholes equation is that we go long, if I can write, go long the option and short the asset. And in particular, we wanna do, take some position, so I'm gonna call the position pi, so it's going to be long the asset or long the option and then short some proportion of the asset and the proportion we're going to call delta so delta is going to be you know our, our hedge, hedging factor and what are we trying to do we're trying to hedge changes in the asset price against the option price so that means if the asset price changes a little bit we want our our position to not change in value at all and it turns out we're going to have to keep rehedging every time step so this is a dynamic hedge. And what is it? So we, we haven't got to the point where we know what delta is yet, but we're we're gonna figure out what delta is pretty soon. So let's take a derivative here. So the change in our the value of our portfolio is just gonna be dv minus delta ds, just taking a derivative. And now what's dv? dv we can use Ito's lemma. And so we have to use the multi-dimensional Ito's lemma that we did last time. So how do you do that? It's the first derivative parts. So the derivative with respect to s ds, derivative respect to t, dt. And now we have to do the second order part. And if you remember, so here is, this is our formula for ds. Here's our a part from the lemma, and here's the b part. And the second derivative has a b squared term. So we have to not forget about that. So we have a half sigma squared s squared partial of v with respect to s squared dt. So Ito's lemma gives us this formula for dv. So now we can write d pi expand that out a bit. So d pi equals dv, so let's just copy this down, t dt plus half times the second derivative stuff, then minus delta ds. Okay, let's collect up terms now. The equation's getting a bit messy. So let's collect up the ds terms first. So we get a partial of v with respect to s minus delta ds, and now let's collect up the dts. And so we get a v with respect to t, plus half sigma squared s squared partial of v with respect to s second derivative dt. Okay, so I just collected the terms and now we choose delta equals to partial of v with respect to s. And so this choice means that this will go to zero. And in fact, we just get d pi is v with respect to t plus the half sigma squared s squared second partial with respect to s dt. Okay, so we've managed to choose our delta now and our delta is eliminating all the stochastic part of the change of value of our portfolio right so if you remember when we have a, a stochastic equation like this there's the deterministic part and the stochastic part the random part and we're setting the random part equal to zero so what does that mean if we have an equation that is entirely deterministic now we can use the no arbitrage argument and the no arbitrage argument says that if we have cash flows that are known, then they have to be equal. And so what's another known cash flow that's entirely deterministic? That is putting your money in the bank. So if you put your money in the bank, what do you get? You get the change of your bank account is the interest rate times the amount of money you have times the time step. So just expanding that out, that means we have R times our position was long, the option, short, some amount of stock, dt. So now we have a formula for d pi here. So we've got this one, we've got this one here. So let's put them together. So I'm gonna do this this one here on the left. It's partial with respect to t plus a half sigma squared s squared, second one squared dt. Now I'm doing the right side, this one over here. So this will be RV. And what was a delta? So if you remember that delta, this is partial of V with respect to S. So remember, we chose our delta. So let's plug that in down here. So RV minus R partial of V with respect to S times S. And this is all times DT. Now using some physics math, we can divide both sides by DT. So mathematicians hate this, but you know, it works. Let's do it. Now I'll 
rewrite this. So sigma squared s squared second derivative with respect to s squared equals rv minus r partial with respect to s times s. And now I'm just going to move everything to the left hand side. Nothing too exciting. With respect to t, sigma squared s squared second partial with respect to s. Now plus r s partial of v with respect to s minus r v equals zero. So I just moved everything to the left and look at that. We have the Black-Scholes equation. Here it is, Black-Scholes. Pretty cool. So I'm gonna review this just because I wanna remember this. This is good. So we started with the asset and the option. We assumed that the asset was log normal random walk. So that gives us this formula. Black-Scholes, we take a position that's long the option and short some quantity of the asset. So here's our position and the change of our asset position of our position is going to be here then Ito's lemma lets us write a formula for our change of asset of the change of our position and we choose our delta in order to make the random part of our d pi go away and so choosing delta within this time step eliminates the randomness at the time step and so we get a deterministic uh, d pi then because we've eliminated the randomness we can use a no arbitrage argument to say this cash flow must be the same as money in the bank and so here's money in the bank, put these equal and sub, you know, substitute everything in, we get this equation, divide by dt, group terms together, and you have the Black-Scholes equation. Pretty neat, I like it. Let's try and understand the Black-Scholes equation. So Black-Scholes, so what's the equation? Partial of v with respect to t plus half sigma squared s squared, second partial of v with respect to s plus r s, partial with respect to s minus rv equals zero. All right, so now let's try and understand this term by term. So the first term is the change of the option price over time, and then it has three components. This one, this term here, and this term at the end. So what's the term at the end here? This is actually a reactive term. So what does that mean? So if you look here, the, the change in option price over time is directly proportional to the value of the option price right now. So when you have changes that are directly proportional to the value, the solution is exponential. So we saw this with the time value of money. It's the same situation where the, the, the rate of change is proportional with the interest rate. And so you get exponential growth or decay. All right, what about this middle term? This is actually the convective term. So convection is flow, like a wind carrying particles in, in, in the air or heat being transferred by waves in, in liquid, something like that. So let's try and do an example to see how that looks. So I'm gonna draw V as a function of S. So here's S. So this is not a financial example, this is just a, a mathematical sort of example. So there's some sort of bump. So if partial of V with respect to T equaled partial of V with respect to S, so it's just directly proportional, what happens? So what is partial of V with respect to S? Well, here it's increasing, increasing, then it's zero, it's flat. Now it's decreasing, decreasing, and now it's back to flat. So it's zero, positive, zero, negative, back to zero. Now, if you add that over here, so here if we add on positive stuff on the left, then flat at the top, and then negative stuff on the right, and then back to zero, what happened? The bump is moving to the left, so we have movement. And you can imagine if you put a negative here, then it would it would move to the right. So that's the convective part. It's you know bumps moving along, flowing along. So what about this this first term? So this term on the left here, this is actually a diffusive term. So diffusion. So how does that work? So the way I understand diffusion is with is from physics. It's the one-dimensional bar. So we've got a bar here. There's a little piece here with a width of delta x. And now there's a couple variables. There's q, which is measuring the heat, and f, which is measuring the temperature. And the, the simplest equation is that q equals f delta x. So temperature is instantaneous at a point, and the heat is a, you know, the area, like in integrating that temperature over a small area. So in this case, we're just at a small little square here. And so it's just f times delta x. And we can immediately take a derivative here. So partial with respect to x, no, t, is partial of f with respect to t delta x. So just the derivative with respect to time. So that's our basic equation. Now, how does heat actually flow? So what do we, what do we know? So heat flows from hot to cold. In other words, from high temperature 
to low temperature. And there's actually a physics law that says it flows in a linear proportional way with some constant proportionality, the conductance. So what does that mean? That means that change in the temperature over time is directly proportional to, now here, the change in temperature. So we want it, we want it to go from high to low to have a positive flow. And so let's first look at the temperature on the left side. So this will be x and this is x plus delta x. So on the left side, what's happening to the temperature? We have partial of f with respect to x. And then if that's positive, so if this is going up, the temperature is increasing like that. That means there's low temperature here, high temperature here. That means that heat is gonna be flowing out. So we'll have a negative at x comma t. And now on the right side, so here if it's going up, so if we have delta f with respect to x at x plus delta x comma t, if this is positive, that means our little unit here is the low temperature and outside is the high temperature. That means the heat is flowing in. So we're gonna get a plus here. So the change in heat is flowing out if that's positive. So it's going from our little thing left if the temperature is increasing, increasing going left to right. And then here it's flowing in if temperature is increasing left to right here. Okay, so this is partial of Q with respect to T, partial of Q with respect to T, we, these can be set equal. So let's do that. Let's say partial of F with respect to T delta X equals K. I'm just gonna swap these around. Partial of F with respect to X, X plus delta X minus evaluated at X. Okay, now I just divide both sides by uh, delta X. And now I have a formula for partial of F with respect to T. It's this thing here. Now I wanna take the take the limit as delta x goes to zero, what happens? You end up with partial of f with respect to t equals k. And as delta x gets smaller and smaller, you know, what does this look like here? This is a function, function evaluated at the right minus a function evaluated at the left over the difference. So if you remember back to calculus, this limit will actually be the derivative. So the second derivative there, because this is our function is the first derivative. And then this Taking the limit gives another derivative, so we end up with a second derivative. And so this equation here is the heat equation. And so you see the you have a function, the derivative with respect to temp to time is directly proportional to the second derivative with respect to space. If we look up here, we have the derivative with respect to time is you know some function proportional to the second derivative with respect to space. So that's diffusion. Pretty cool. In chapter seven, I learned about the Greeks. So Greeks. So what are the Greeks? The Greeks are Greek letters and some other names that represent various mathematical quantities. So one of them we've seen before, delta. That was partial of V with respect to S. We saw this in the uh, Black-Scholes. Black -Scholes. So when we derived Black-Scholes, we saw a delta. And what was delta? Delta was the amount of stock we had to short. So this is the, we short the asset by a factor delta to balance out the long option. And that was the instantaneous time step as we derive Black-Scholes. All right, so what does this represent? This represents the sensitivity to changes in the underlying. So as the asset price changes, the option price changes, and the delta represents you know, the ratio there. So if, if delta is three, if the asset price goes up one, then the option price should go up three. But that's just a linear model. That's not the whole story. So then we come to the next one, gamma. This is the second derivative with respect to S. And so gamma is a sensitivity of delta to changes in the underlying. So what happens? S changes, then that makes delta change, and we have to rehedge. All right. So if the asset price, if we're perfectly hedged and shorting the asset, you know, following the Black-Scholes model, so we have, we're long an option and short the asset, and then the asset price changes, delta will change by an amount gamma. So let's draw a little diagram, trying to make this visual. Okay. Here is S. First, I'm going to draw the payoff. Here's the payoff. This is a call option. So here's the strike price here. Now I'll draw the value of the option before the payoff. That's not very good. I'll do that again. So this is V of S. So it's sort of a, a curve here. So if we look at a specific point, so up here, what's delta? Delta equals one. Down here, delta is about zero. And around here, maybe delta equals a half. And so this is how much stock we have to short to, to hedge changes in the option price. So this is the, the option as a function of the asset price. And what about gamma? So if you think about the second derivative, if the second derivative is positive, 
you get something like this. The second derivative is negative, you get something like this, just parabolas. So which way does the second derivative go? It opens upwards like this, and so gamma is greater than zero. If gamma is greater than zero, you can say that we're long gamma. So if we're doing the Black-Scholes strategy and we're long the option and short the stock for a call option, we're long gamma. What does that mean? That means as we rehedge, every time we rehedge, we have a profit. But that's not all roses because if the asset asset price is not changing, then we're we're losing money basically. We're not gaining enough money to make up for the cost of our position. So you might imagine that gamma is zero, so we could be neutral gamma. And so neutral gamma is nice because that means that we don't have to rehedge very often. So it saves hedging costs. So if there are transaction costs, like it costs money to buy and sell over and over again to hedge every little time period, if we're gamma neutral, that means that as S changes, delta won't change very much. I mean, it might change a little bit because this is not a perfect, this is a linear model of how fast delta will change and there's a higher order terms, but this will make delta change not as fast as it would otherwise, which means that our hedging will be simplified. And so what's an example? We might have an exotic option. And so we delta hedge by shorting the underlying and then gamma hedge by buying and selling vanilla options. And so this means that we've made it so that the value of our exotic option as the asset price changes we, we don't change the value of the exotic option, but then our delta hedge might change, but then because we gamma hedged, that made gamma zero, and that means that our delta doesn't change very much as the price changes. And so this means we're almost entirely hedged so that the asset price change doesn't change any you know anything in our position, but it's not the whole story, there's more. So there's speed, and this is the third derivative of V with respect to S. And so this is just another higher order term. So this is the sensitivity of gamma to changes in the underlying. All right, so that's the most, that's the highest order derivative that's commonly used, but you can imagine there's even, you know, higher order stuff, but that becomes ridiculous. So what else do we have? So another Greek is capital theta. So capital theta is the change with respect to T. So it's the sensitivity of the option price to time. So for a call option, this will generally be negative. You're losing value over time. And for other, other types of options, it could be positive or negative. All right, now we have another section. I, I think of this as parameter risk. So first we have vega. This is definitely not a Greek letter, but vega is a change of V with respect to volatility. So this is the sensitivity to volatility, volatility. So this is a little bit weird because the volatility is a parameter of the Black-Scholes model. So it, it doesn't, you can't really take the derivative to it and have it be that meaningful. But if we sort of, you know, don't think about that too much, we can see that if you change the volatility, the value of the option right now changes. And so by, by plotting out Vega, we can see how much risk we have for using the wrong volatility in our calculations. And you might think that if you make Vega smaller, there's less risk to using the wrong volatility or misestimating volatility. But there's a little bit of a danger here. So one little caveat is this only makes sense if gamma has a single sign. So always positive or always negative. If gamma changes sign, then the vega starts not having a, an understandable interpretation. It stops being useful. So another Greek is rho. So rho equals change of V with respect to R. This is sensitivity to interest rate. And so, and again, R was a parameter of our model. So, you know, this is, you have to have a little bit of faith that this makes sense, but you can take the derivative with respect to R and think that as, as our assumptions about the interest rate change, how does that affect our valuation of the option? And you can think if this is very large, you might be at risk for having a bad estimate of the interest rate. It's pretty cool. So the Greeks are a way to talk about option pricing and they actually give you a way to think about how to implement hedges. So that's pretty neat. All right, we've seen Black-Scholes. Now let's see a generalization. So generalize Black-Scholes. All right, so how do you generalize the Black-Scholes equation? So one cool example in chapter eight is considering what if borrowing isn't free? So remember in the Black-Scholes equation, we assumed you could go short a stock and there was no cost to doing that. There's, you can short as much as you want, there's no interest rate you have to pay or anything, but that's not true. In the real world, if you borrow someone's stock, you have to pay for the privilege. So how does that work? So let's start doing 
our derivation. So let's assume we have a, a log normal asset. So that's the mu s dt plus sigma s dx. So log normal. And now we have our position pi. It's gonna be long the option, short the stock. And then, so this is just like in Black-Scholes. Now the, the equation that describes the change of our position is gonna be dv minus delta ds, except this time there's gonna be more. We're gonna to have to pay interest here. So there's gonna be a minus r. r is gonna be our interest rate we pay as we borrow stock. And then it's gonna be the max of zero delta s dt. All right, what are these terms? So r is our interest rate for borrowing. The max of zero delta, this is how much we're gonna borrow and the price. And then dt is just time step. So this is the interest rate times the number of shares times the price times the time step will give the total amount of interest we pay in one time step. And that'll be the change of our position. will be the option changing, the, the short position changing, and we're paying interest. So why is it the max here? So the max part, if you think about delta is the number of shares that we've gone short. So if delta is greater than zero, then we are in fact short. If delta is less than zero, we're actually not short. We're, we're long the stock. And so the max here, if delta is positive, it'll just be delta. And if delta is negative, this max will be zero, in which case this is indicating we're not paying any interest if we're long the stock. We're only paying interest if we're actually short the stock in the time step. All right, so now let's keep going. Let's just do the other steps of deriving Black-Scholes from here. And so what we wanna do is expand dv using Ito's lemma. And so if you remember, this was partial of v with respect to t dt plus partial of v with respect to s ds. And you have to have the squared term. So sigma squared, s squared, second derivative of v with respect to s dt. And now get the rest of the equation minus delta ds minus r max zero delta s dt run out of room okay now let's group up terms so we have a t a t a t and the s a ds so when we group the s's together we get partial of v with respect to s minus delta and then if we, we want to set this to zero so we want the randomness to go away we can choose delta so if we set this to zero that means that delta equals partial of v with respect to s and so we we do that choice and these go away and we're left with the dt's. So d pi equals partial v respect to t plus half sigma squared s squared second respect to s minus r max zero delta s. That whole thing, dt, all right? So this is looking familiar. We just have this new term. And so the next thing we, we think is that there is no randomness. There's only dt, the deterministic. And so by the no arbitrage argument, this will be the risk-free rate proportional to the size of our position times dt. So this is just risk-free uh, interest. And then set these equal and we get, let's write out all the terms here. So I'm, I'm setting these equal. Let's also expand out pi here. So this will be r v minus delta, which is partial of v with respect to s dt. So I'm gonna set these equal and divide both sides by dt. We get partial of v with respect to t plus half sigma squared s squared max of zero and delta times s and then that equals rv minus r partial v respect to s times s so this is v minus delta s all right and now just collect all the terms on the left so v respect to t plus a half sigma squared s squared second derivative respect to s plus r s partial of v respect to s minus r v minus r max zero delta times s equals zero. And here it is. Is that right? That looks right. So this is the Black-Scholes that has been generalized so that it has borrowing. And one of the interesting things is that this term here is nonlinear, nonlinear. So what does that mean? That means that this is a stochastic differential equation that is nonlinear. So when I start hearing that, I think, how am I gonna solve this analytically? But then I think, I don't have to, I can just do it numerically. Who needs to solve it analytically? So this is pretty cool. This is our first example of generalizing the Black-Scholes equation. And our assumption was borrowing stock isn't free. It takes an interest rate. We added a term to our, our change of our position. 
and just went through the same Black-Scholes derivation and we come up with our stochastic differential equation at the end and it just has a new term here and it's cool because it's nonlinear. Neat stuff. So I work for a tech company and they grant me options and every day over lunch we look at the stock price and you know, debate whether we should exercise our options. So what are we doing? We're actually deciding when to exercise. So these are American style options. And the critical thing is that the American part means that we have to choose when to exercise. And so if we, if we wait too long, the stock might go down. So presumably the, the stock is doing well above our exercise price and we might exercise and lock in our profits or we can let it ride and you know, hope the stock goes up even more tomorrow. And so every day there's a choice. So how are we gonna figure out when we should exercise our options? So the first simplification is we're gonna say that they're perpetual. And that means we don't have to worry about time. So no T to worry about. So this simplifies the equations. And this doesn't mean that time isn't happening. It just means that every day is just like the last day, except the stock price could be different. And by looking at the current stock price, that's the only thing we're gonna use to make up our mind about whether to exercise or not. We never have to worry about you know, how much time until the option is, is done. We just assume it, it never is done. All right, so let's start doing some math. So we have black shoals with dividend and no time. So what's that gonna be? It's gonna be half sigma squared s squared second derivative v with s plus r minus d s dv ds minus rv equals zero. So this is just black shoals with dividend. So here's here's the dividend. And we have regular derivatives because we have a V is just a function of S. There's no time. And some of the other equations of Black-Scholes, we had some other uh, partial of V with respect to T or V with respect to S times DT and all that's gone away now. All right, what's the solution? So I'm not gonna work out the solution, but there is one. So the solution is that V of S equals A S to the alpha plus plus B S to the alpha minus, and A and B are some constants. And then the alpha plus or minus is one over sigma squared, negative R minus D minus a half sigma squared, plus or minus square root of R minus D minus a half sigma squared, plus two R sigma squared. Okay, so here's the solution. So if you believe this, then you can just keep going. If you don't believe this, you can plug this into uh, the equation up here. So take first expand, you know, put the alphas in here, take the first and second derivative, and then plug everything in and hopefully everything simplifies to zero. If not, you find your errors and correct them. If you if you want to have a little bit easier time, you can use a computer algebra system like Mathematica or Sage. So Sage, if you haven't heard about it, is a, a Python-based open source computer algebra system. Highly recommended. So give that a try. So once you've convinced yourself this is a solution, now what? Well, we can get rid of one of these. So we know that a call option as S goes to zero, so as my stock starts going bankrupt, what happens to my options? My options become worthless. And that means that B has to be zero. So why is that? So alpha, so alpha plus is positive and alpha minus is negative. And so as S goes to zero, S will become very small to a negative power, that's like dividing by a large power of s. As s gets really small, that's multiplying by larger and larger numbers. And so unless b is zero, this will go to infinity. So b has to be zero to make this to make v go to zero as s gets small. So b has to be zero. So now we have v of s equals a s alpha plus. And what happens at expiration time? So when we exercise the option, we get some payoff. And our strategy is going to be to wait for some preset price, S star, and then exercise. When we hit that, what other strategy could you have? That's, that's basically the only strategy. And just the question is, what is S star? How, how, how high do I wait for the stock to go before I exercise? And so the payoff, S star, what's the payoff? It'll be the price minus the strike price. That'll be my, my payoff. And then from this equation up here, we also have V of S star is A S star to the alpha plus. And so these are equal. So we know these have to be the same. So we can say that a s star to the alpha plus equals s star minus e. But we have one equation and we have two unknowns. We don't, we don't know a and we don't know s star. So we need more. So what else can we say? The next step is to maximize v by choosing s star. So of course I'm, I'm deciding when to exercise my options. I wanna maximize my value that I get out of my option. And that's 
how I'm going to choose my S star to maximize my value. So what does that mean? I want to take dv ds and set it equal to zero, then solve for S star. And we are, we, oh, from up here, we can have a function of A. So A is S star minus E over S star to the alpha plus. So we can write A in terms of S star. And here we have a big equation. We have one variable, S star, setting the derivative equal to zero. We can maximize V. And without working through all the details, because I'm lazy, what's the solution? So the solution is S star equals E over one minus one over alpha plus. So here is the optimal exercise price. So this is what I wait for until I exercise. But then an interesting observation is that as D goes to zero, so the dividends, so I, I'm working at a tech company, I look up on Google Finance, I look up dividends, and I don't see a number, I see little dashes. The company does not pay dividends, and so dividends are actually zero for a lot of tech companies. And so what does that mean? D goes to zero, alpha plus, let's look back at alpha plus, you can look over here, you know, work through when D goes to zero, D is zero here, you know, you simplify some stuff, you see that actually alpha plus goes to one. And so as alpha plus goes to one, S star, this is gonna be one minus one, so this is gonna be smaller and smaller, and that's gonna get bigger and bigger, so S star goes to infinity. So as the dividends get smaller, our optimal exercise price gets larger and larger and goes to infinity. And in fact, at D equals zero, the solution is to never exercise, exclamation mark. So that means that for my tech stock, I should never exercise my options. And in fact, what should I do instead? I, you know, actually, instead of exercising my options when they're worth money and I'm scared that they're gonna go down, I should sell the option rather than exercise it. So someone, someone else might have a bet. And so there's, just, there's still value in the option and I can sell the option rather than exercising to get the value out of it. So this is pretty interesting stuff. So there's quite a bit of math here, which I haven't actually worked out. I've just sort of written out the solution. And so the process was writing Black-Scholes with dividend, then solving it, because we can do that with the, the, the assumption that things are perpetual. Then we did a continuity argument for at the time of exercise, the value of the option is related to the payoff, and it's also continuous with our solution. So there's a continuity argument here. Then maximizing our option value was setting the derivative equal to zero and solving for the optimal exercise price. And so this is a, an argument that the derivative of the option price is continuous everywhere. And by solving the optimal exercise price, we actually came to the conclusion that for tech stocks that don't pay a dividend, you shouldn't exercise the options ever. And in fact, this conclusion carries over when there's an end to the option, when it's, when it's not a perpetual option. That's pretty interesting.